Welcome back. You know, in 2008, an American psychic, Sylvia Brown, she said that in the year 2020, a severe pneumonia-like illness will spread throughout the globe, attacking the lungs and bronchial tubes and resisting all known treatments. Spooky, eh? But then again, she also thought that a volcanic eruption would completely wipe out Japan. That obviously didn't happen that the US would leave Iraq in 2004, which they didn't, that she would live to the age of 88, and she died at 77, so not all that good. You see, prediction is hard, as Yogi Bear once said, especially when it's about the future. But that hasn't deterred our next guest. Kai Werner is here, he's CTO of Confluent, and he's here to predict the top use cases for data in motion in 2022. So let's welcome our very own Nostradamus. Kai Werner, are you there? I, I can't hear you, Kai, yet. Let's see if we can get your audio working properly. Can you hear me now? You hear me now? I can hear you now. How are you? Good, I'm right. good, and I'm glad to do some predictions now. <laughs> have, you, have you got your crystal ball? Yeah, yeah, something like something that. Like now it's I, I can't little, see it, little, but... Little, 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 little. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, best of luck, Kai. We're looking forward to your predictions. Take it away when you're ready. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank so, you. hi, everybody, so, and, everybody, and I'm glad to talk glad here. To talk and here. Um, Of course, this is not really just predictions, but I'm taking a look at the market these days, and I'm looking at what our customers are doing next year. And therefore, um, I think today it's clear that um, everybody agrees that you need to process data in real time today for many use cases. And around that, there is a lot of different scenarios and architectures. And I simply want to show you where the trend goes from our customer base. And, and this will be very practical. So I will show you several different architectures and real world examples from real world deployment so that you can really get a feeling about what's coming and, and what you can take a look at. And so uh, in the beginning, when I also prepared this presentation and thought about not just what are our customers doing and planning, but also what is the market seeing. And um, Gardner is always a good way to look at, um, not because they coin a lot of new buzzwords every year, they are doing a very good job in that, but really they just see simply, um, no matter at which one you take a look, it's really the topics are, it's more about data, it's about being more intelligent, it's about elastic and scalable infrastructures. And so, increase the flexibility and agility to be more innovative in your business, no matter what industry you're in. And I think this is really the, the lesson learned for 2022. And this is also now what I want to present you today. So just as, as having the same background, everybody, um, in the end, what I mean with data in motion, as it said in the title, I really mean that for many use cases, you need to process data in real time because that beats slow data in many use cases. No matter if you want to increase the revenue or reduce the cost or reduce the risk. So there is always business goals, but in the end, it's about having a better customer experience and having a better business revenue. And here's just a few examples across industries. But if you think about that, and if we, we can take any business event like fraud detection and banking, you need to detect it before it happened and not in a batch process overnight. If you order a taxi, you want to know when it's coming and you don't want just to see a notification after it's here. And you can go on and on with these use cases. And this is just the foundation of this talk, what I mean with data in motion everywhere. And we will see where the trends are going in the architectures and use cases. So, and this is really still a fundamental paradigm shift for many people. I think everybody agrees on the added value of real-time data, but still similarly to what the cloud did maybe five years ago. Today, most people are going in the cloud, at least for some of their use cases and architectures. And in a similar way today, when we talk about data in motion and the technology behind that with event streaming, this is also new about thinking about data, like continuously processing it. That's a huge added value, but it's also a paradigm shift for your architectures and for your, how you implement your projects. And that's what I want to talk about today in more detail. Therefore, just one more introductory slide um, so that we really have the same understanding. When I talk about data in motion and about event streaming, then in most cases, this means Apache Kafka, which became the de facto standard as an open source framework for processing data in real time with this solution. There is other 
open source frameworks and products in the market, of course, but the, 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 the de facto standard is Kafka. That's why I'm using this for most of the examples. And in the end, the point really is that it's not just about sending data from A to B. That's important, but that's a traditional messaging system, what we can do for 20 years already. Now, the point is that you can integrate with different data sources and data sinks and process the data and aggregate it and correlate it in real time at scale, even for high volumes of data. And all of this together, that is what event streaming and Kafka is. And that's what we are thinking about as a backbone for um, the use cases we talk about today. So here are the five use cases I want to show you. And this is a little bit my prediction, right? Um, of course, it's also what I see from some customers that are a little bit, let's say, early adopters of new paradigms. And therefore, as I said, I will also show you several real world examples about these topics today. The first one actually, and the, the, the principle is not new, it exists for several years, is the Kappa architecture. So you might wonder what that is. So, Let's start with another principle first, with the Lambda architecture. That's what many of you might know. So this is often used in big data architectures for the last five to 10 years. So this means in the end, you have different data sources and some of the data is processed in a real-time layer in a few milliseconds or a few seconds. And on the other side, you still have batch processes for ETL jobs, for analytics, for reporting. And then you have a serving layer so that the different consumers of these applications can get the data out of there, right? So this is one example of the Lambda architecture. There is a second example. Um, in this case now, we have a completely separate real-time layer and a batch layer. So that in the end, these are two completely different infrastructures. And then on the client side, on the consumer side, you sometimes need to mix it together. So no matter which of these two architectures you choose in the Lambda architecture. It has some problems for many use cases. And here I'm actually referring to a talk um, we have seen at the last Kafka summit from Disney. So they explained the, their problems with the Lambda architecture. And this is really what we see in the real world from many of our customers. Like um, often you have to write duplicate code because many pipelines then are implemented twice, once for the real-time stream and once for the batch stream. And of course, under the hood, this adds a lot of complexity. And in the end, you have to operate two different infrastructures, one for the real-time pipeline and one for the batch pipeline. And this makes many things much, much harder than it should be. And with this in mind now about the Lambda architecture, here is the Kappa architecture. That's a term that Jay Krebs coined a few years ago. Jay Krebs is the inventor of Apache Kafka. So I think he's know what, what he's doing, right? And in the end, what he defined is here the Kappa architecture. In this case, in the middle, you see just one pipeline. So it's a real-time pipeline, data in motion. This doesn't mean that everything is real-time or will be real-time in the future, no you still have your batch processes for reporting, for example, for training analytic models, that's batch processes. And that's what you maybe do in a data lake or with a business intelligence tool, that's totally fine. But some other applications, of course, need to be real time, like the alerting system. But now the key difference with the Kappa architecture is that you only have one single infrastructure to build. It's much less complex to build this infrastructure and because the heart of the infrastructure is real time, now you can provide the data both for the real time and for the batch systems. So let me talk a little bit more about the detail here. So um, in the past, the ingestion layer was where you only stored the data for a few hours or a few days. And then you deleted it out of Kafka or another system because it was in the other data lake already. Um, the benefit today is that many of these event streaming platforms today also provide a tiered storage. So this means even in the event streaming platform, you can store data long term. And this can be for a month, this can be for a year, and this can be forever. And this can be gigabytes or terabytes or even petabytes. So you don't have to worry if you want to store more data in Kafka in a cost efficient way, right? And this is super important if you want to build a Kappa architecture, because in Kappa, many consumers consume it in real time, but still there is often batch consumption where you consume historical data. So you need the long-term storage then in many cases. 
And now with this in mind, let me show you three real world examples for a Kappa architecture. And all of them presented at a former Kafka summit. So you can talk, um, you can listen to their talks in much more detail if you're interested. The first one is, is Uber. So here you see exactly what I showed you before. So Uber has many data producers on the left side. And then they have built one streaming pipeline with Kafka. And then on top of that, on the right side, you see many of them are real-time consumers. Some are directly consuming via Kafka clients. Some others use other technologies like Apache Flink. That's where you can choose this per service or per application. And still, of course, Uber has some batch processes like Hadoop in this example. And the difference to a Lambda architecture, however, is that even Hadoop as a batch layer gets the data via Kafka. And again, this simplifies the architecture a lot because you only build one pipeline to all these different consumers. And that's the huge added value. Another example is Shopify. So Shopify described in their Kafka Summit talk how they leverage the Kafka log as the source of truth for many different systems. So here it's always the same story, the same story right? You store data in Kafka for real-time consumers and for batch systems and for replaying the data later for historical use cases. So there's plenty of different examples. I will not go into detail here because that's a talk on its own. And that's what these companies gave on the Kafka Summit talks. So the third example is Disney, where we have seen the trade-offs before already about the Lambda architecture. And therefore Disney is doing the Kappa architecture to keep the architecture simple to reduce the code duplication, to operate one infrastructure instead of two infrastructures for doing all the data processing. And therefore with this, I know I'm more or less running through these examples, but again, you can talk and take a look at these in detail for their presentations. But with this first point, you hopefully learned that often the Lambda architecture can be simplified a lot and still combining real-time and batch data. The second example I see more and more is hyper-personalized omnichannel. So this is actually not just in retail, but retail is the most prevalent example, right? But you need omnichannel everywhere where you have customers taking a look at your data. And in the end, the challenge is to you know, build innovative new business models and provide a better customer experience, but with that also provide a better operational backend that is efficient and real-time. And this is the core challenge we see at our customers. So here's a real world example for that. This is AO.com, an electrical retailer. So AO.com had a lot of stores across the country, right? Um, but now they are also providing a hyper-personalized online experience. And this is much more advanced than what you might know from Amazon for 20 years. So 20 years ago, we already saw on Amazon where this customer has bought this product. So maybe you are also interested in another product. What's happening here now is much more context specific in real time per customer. So while the user or customer is on the website and while he's using his mouse to take a look at products or attributes, he gets context specific information like upselling information or additional information about the product or maybe a discount or coupon for the product. And all of that works because under the hood in the back end, all the data about the customer is correlated in real time. The data is coming from the loyalty platform, from the CRM system, from the log analytics and so on to act in real time while the customer is on the website. And this is a super powerful example for Omnichannel. And in the end, the point again is with the event streaming platform in the middle, you can use the data like you need it for many use cases in real time and for some others still in batch. So this is super complementary to the Kappa architecture we discussed before. Like in this case, um, when you are a car retailer, a car shop, then you correlate different events from the past, like from the newsletters 60 and 90 days ago, from the car configurator. 10 and eight days ago. And then when the customer is walking into the car dealership on site, then you provide the real-time location-based service so that the salesperson gets all this context-specific data in real time before the customer actually enters the store so that you can do the right recommendations for the customer. And all of this is omnichannel and real-time. 
And with this real-time infrastructure in place, the same data again can also be used by other people and business units like the data science team or the business intelligence team. And here, once again, we see how these different concepts are complementary because with a Kappa architecture, you see that you build this pipeline once in the first use case for real time. But then when you have this pipeline, other teams can also consume the data and not all of them are real time. Like a data science team uses a Python client for Kafka and then they only consume the historical data once to train analytic models with Python and with machine learning frameworks like TensorFlow. And this is the beauty of such an architecture when you provide it omnichannel for the customer experience, but then also for all these other business units you have. And there is also plenty of real world examples for that, right? Like um, Walmart, which is the biggest employer in the US, um, they leverage Apache Kafka as their heart for everything they are doing for omnichannel, for the customer experience, but also for the back end, for the real time inventory and supply chain optimization. So let's take a look at that. So, and once again, the good news is all the examples I'm talking about today, you can take a deeper look at that at our Kafka Summit events. So all of that is for free and on demand so that you can take a look where the end users present about this. And in this case, Walmart has built a real-time inventory system. And that's super important if you want to provide context-specific recommendations and information to your customer. And it doesn't matter if the customer is using the mobile app and buy something online, or maybe then wants to pick it up in one specific Walmart store. So you always need to correlate the information in the back end in real time, reliably at scale, so that every customer can get the right customer experience. And on top of that, you can then give discounts or upselling or whatever your use case is. And this is super powerful. And therefore, again, Walmart is just one of the examples we have for this. So let me now go to this third point. Um, this is a little bit more um, um, overall um, um, industries like multi-cloud deployments. This is a clear trend we see everywhere. Now, many of our customers have a cloud first strategy today. However, still many other things are still running in their data centers. And then some customers start with one cloud provider, but over time, or maybe with merchant acquisition, most of our customers have more than one cloud. And therefore, um, this is super complex to integrate with each other. And I mean, as you might know from many um, um, other examples already in the last years, um, Kafka is a perfect tool for integrating these systems. And in many cases, not just in one data center, but across different data centers or different clouds. Because Kafka on the one side is a real-time streaming system, but on the other side, and that's the unique differentiation to a traditional middleware or messaging system. In contrary to that, Kafka is also a storage system. And with that, it really truly decouples the producers from the consumers. And with that, you can connect legacy systems that are maybe batch or file-based and connect them with real-time streaming systems. And this is where Kafka is super strong to be used for. And so when we are now talking about different data centers or different clouds, then uh, first of all, this is a logical view. Many people today use a new buzzword for that with the data mesh, right? But no matter if you call it data mesh or still talk about domain-driven design and microservices, which are also part of the data mesh, the point is you have different applications and different infrastructure in different infrastructures and in different data centers, and you need to connect it to each other. Well, and as we heard in the beginning, real-time data beats slow data. So also for the replication between the different regions and locations and data centers, the Kafka protocol is perfect for that, right? As you see in this picture. And with that, different domains can build their own data products, but they can then also replicate this data in real time to another domain where someone else can consume it. And maybe someone else is not real time. That doesn't matter because under the hood, it's still the same idea of the Kappa architecture. If the replication between the domains is real time, then your consumer can do whatever they want to do with the data. And here is one example for such a hybrid multi-cloud architecture. And this is really what we see in the real world more and more across industries. And 
I do not want to go now into the, the specific technology here shown, right? So um, in the cloud, you might use a specific data warehouse like Snowflake, or you use a security tool like Splunk for log aggregation. And maybe on premise, you're running an SAP system or a mainframe. That doesn't matter, and it's different for every single deployment. But the point is, now with event streaming, you can integrate all of these different systems and infrastructures. And the heart of this infrastructure is real-time and reliable, including the linking of these clusters. So what we are doing as part of the event streaming platform, we can link clusters together, no matter where they are. So you can link an on-premise cluster to your cluster in AWS, to your cluster in GCP or Azure. And then there in the cloud, you can connect all these other systems to the related Kafka cluster. And this is a huge benefit because with that, again, even across data center and clouds, the heart is real time and reliable and scalable, no matter what you're doing then in one cloud or in one data center. And this is really a clear trend we see across all industries and markets to leverage Kafka and integration for these kind of architectures. And last but not least, and one note on that. So because we are going more and more to the cloud, you should really think about that. When you're going to the cloud, then an event streaming platform typically should be a fully managed service because one main advantage of the cloud is that you can focus on the business problems and use an elastic scalable service, right? The problem is, however, that when you're going to the cloud today, most vendors are just provisioning infrastructure for you, for Kafka. And then you still have to do all these other things by yourself, like the sizing, like the performance tuning, like the bug fixing and so on. So this shouldn't be the case. And um, this is just, I want to give you as a reminder, when you're taking a look into the cloud, really take a look what fully managed means because many vendors are just using this as a marketing term. This is a, just a hint I give you when you're migrating event streaming into the cloud. And with that, let me go to the fourth item of this agenda today. This is about edge analytics. So we now talked a lot about the cloud and moving to the cloud with a cloud first strategy. And this is super important, right? Um, and, and this makes sense for most use cases. However, not everything can and will go to the cloud. There is many different reasons. This can be security reasons. This can be latency reasons. And this can be cost reasons. And therefore, the edge is also getting more and more important for many use cases. And therefore, we see more and more deployments where customers deploy the cloud Kafka cluster with Kafka at the edge. And at the edge then really means outside a data center. That can mean in a retail store. That can mean in a factory, in manufacturing. That can be on a ship, that can be everywhere. And um, this is another clear trend we see for doing edge analytics, completely decoupled from the data center or cloud for some of the use cases. There's plenty of examples where edge, edge uh, makes sense. One example is low latency requirements. And here's a few examples where often 5G is used also. So that you really have something like more like 10 millisecond processing end to end. The cloud is not the right infrastructure for that. And here's just examples like if you want to build innovative services around a stadium and you go to a soccer match or around gaming when you need to uh, provide the data in real time between millions of users and many other examples where low latency is required. And that requires some kind of edge computing. So here is one example of a hybrid edge architecture. As I've talked a lot about retail examples, let's stay with that. At the top, you see the traditional event streaming cluster. This can run in a data center or in the cloud. And here you build your traditional monitoring systems. You connect to the CRM like Salesforce in this example, and you build your cloud applications and integrate with a cloud database. However, for some other use cases, you need to do edge computing, like in a retail store at the bottom. And in this case, then, each retail store has its own event streaming platform. So because in the retail store, it's also important that you process data in real time. Think about the location-based service. While the customer is walking through your store, you want to send him 
a recommendation or you want to send him a discount. And you have to do this with low latency before the customer has left the store. Because when the customer has left the store, then he will go to the competitor, to another store and not buy the new store anymore. So this only works if you act on the data in real time. And the other advantage of that is that you can even do this in disconnected environments. So in the US, we have already deployed this with many customers where they said, we have hundreds of retail stores and big malls. But during the day, the malls have very bad Wi-Fi. So this doesn't work with replication to the cloud. So we need to do this edge analytics in the store. And the benefit is with a, a Kafka environment, you can do that. Because on the one side, you connect to the mobile app with low latency of the customer. But on the other side, you also directly connect to the point of sale where you do the payment with the transaction. So this is really not just about analytics data, but also about transactional data. And then when you have a better integration with the cloud, when the network is better again, maybe during night, because then the, no people are in the, in the mall and therefore the Wi-Fi is better. Then you replicate all the transactions that happen during the day to the cloud. And because Kafka is not just a messaging system, but also a durable storage system that is reliable with no data loss, you can do this very easily out of the box with a single technology and infrastructure. And again, I'm not just talking about um, theories. So here is one real world example where exactly this is happening. And this is actually the extreme case of this, because in this case, we're talking about Royal Caribbean. Royal Caribbean has cruise ships on the sea. There is very bad internet connectivity and it's very expensive. So they need to run a mission critical Kafka cluster on every single ship that is disconnected from the internet. So they need to communicate with the customer and process transactional data on the ship. And then when they get back to the harbor after three days of a cruise, then they replicate all the data from the last three, three days into the cloud. And then they go on to the next journey and the same happens again. So for most of the three days, this is totally disconnected from the cloud and the internet. But then for a few hours, they replicate the data when they're in the harbor. So this is a perfect example for hybrid scenarios, even if you're disconnected for most of the time. And again, this is not just theory, this is real world. And we deploy this with a lot of different customers, not just in retail or here in this case on, on a cruise ship, but also, for example, in manufacturing or in oil and gas. With that, let me come to the last trend we see and a little bit, and this is definitely the biggest prediction I do for next year, um, because with all these um, successful ransomware attacks and other security issues we have seen in the last 12 months, every executive across every industry will have budget for cybersecurity. And now if you think about cybersecurity, like all the other use cases we've talked about before, it has to act in real time. And the big problem is, and that's ex an example for many of these real world attacks, often it's not just a problem about your IT, but actually it's about the problem of one of the vendors and software you use. Like many of the most famous successful attacks actually are supply chain attacks. This means that not you are having a bug, but your vendor has one. And that vendor might be much more small than you and therefore much easier to attack. And with this in mind, it's true again that real-time data in motion beats slow data. Like I've shown you from all these business cases before, the same is true for cybersecurity and security. So here, if you don't have the situational awareness and the threat intelligence in real time, then it doesn't work. And this has worked at scale reliably. Because if you find out overnight in a batch process that you had an attack, then it's too late because the data is already stolen or encrypted with a ransomware attack. You need to act actively, proactively, or even predictively on attacks. And this is again where event streaming is the perfect solution for that. Because with that, you can connect to many different systems data sources and technologies and correlate the data in real time. So in this case, all these yellow circles, that's what you build for your business applications. This can be the enterprise IT for your customers 360. 
This can be industrial IoT or OT for manufacturing. This can be anything. But the red circle is where connected to this, you can build cybersecurity in the same way, in a cross-cutting way with event streaming. And this is a huge benefit of that. And once again, this is always overlapping with these other concepts we talked about, like a Kappa architecture or like hybrid multi-cloud architectures. So we have customers that deploy Kafka everywhere. And yes, part of that is in the data center. That's what you see on the right side. And also on the top right in the cloud. But on the other side, a lot of this processing also has to happen at the edge, like on a ship or even with a single embedded Kafka broker into a drone or a very small device of hardware. And then you need to integrate all of these with each other in real time, in a scalable way. And therefore, the Kafka ecosystem can be used for all of that. And that's a huge benefit. And then you can use one technology and architecture and deploy it across all these different locations. Of course, they have different scale. In the cloud, you're elastic. You don't worry because it's a serverless offering. In the data center, maybe you have five or 10 nodes. In a drone, you only have one node. But the technology and architecture is the same everywhere. And this is also a huge benefit to simplify the architecture and to reduce the effort and the cost and the risk. And just to give you one example here, um, this is um, in the end what we implemented as one example, what we call Confluence Sigma. So Sigma is an um, open security schema and protocol. So whenever you do log analytics, no matter if you do it with Elasticsearch or with Splunk, or maybe with Kafka and Confluent, or maybe a combination of them, Sigma is an open source protocol so that you can define the schemas and the log structure. And therefore, it's very popular. And either now you can process these messages from all these different data sources with the Sigma structure in a batch process, in a, in a data lake or with Splunk, or in another case, you directly process the data in real time at scale with Confluent, with the stream processors, with technologies like Kafka Streams or KSQL. And so this is a perfect example how you continuously create situational awareness, right? It's very different to process this in motion in contrary to processing it in a data lake at rest where it's often too late to detect a threat and a fraud. And once again, here's a practical example. So this is not theory, this is practice. Intel is one of um, the very popular examples we show often about how they build a cyber intelligence platform. And they do exactly what I said on the last slide. So they are combining, in this case, Confluent as the heart of the infrastructure for doing data integration and data processing at scale in real time with many different technologies integrated. And as part of that, they also use Splunk for some things like anomaly detection, where Splunk is perfect for. So this is really yet another success story. And once again, for all the examples you have seen today, you can take a look at the, the links in the presentation and Google for that. All of that is available as public presentations if you want to learn more about one of these use cases. Well, and as you have seen in this talk, that's actually what we are doing with our customers, of course, right? Um, so Apache Kafka was created over 10 years ago. So today, I really would say it's the de facto standard for data in motion. So every bigger company is using Kafka across projects. And most of them with Confluent, because Confluent was founded by the inventors of Kafka. Today, we are listed on the NASDAQ and have um, so many customers across the globe, across industries, and so much Kafka expertise, because that's the only thing what we are doing. We're only doing event streaming. And therefore, as a conclusion, really, um, you should take a look at that from this perspective. You can, of course, always use just Apache Kafka, the open source framework. I typically see it as a car engine. So you can use this. It's battle tested. It's scalable. And then you can build your own car with that. On the other side, obviously, many of our customers don't want to build a car. They want to focus on the business logic. So they buy the complete car. And that's what we provide as Confluent. While we provide over 80% of the commits to the Kafka project and have all the expertise around that, we also provide a complete car, including security, connectors, data governance, and so on. And if you're in the cloud, you're even more lucky because in the cloud, we provide you the self-driving car level five. It's truly and completely serverless so that you can 100% focus on the business logic and you get mission-critical SLAs and consumption-based pricing. 
And with that, um, this was my talk. I hope this was a good overview. And I mean, next year we will see how many of these predictions or trends are true and what you are doing about that. Feel free to reach out to me and connect on LinkedIn or stay in touch and um, take a look at our other use cases. And with that, I'm, I'm returning back to the moderator and I hope you learned a lot in this, dis in this discussion today. Thank you so much. That was great. Uh, we actually don't have very much time for questions. We're overrunning and a lot of people here are getting very nervous. So I'm going to have to be very brief. I'm sorry about that. But I encourage everyone here to get in contact directly with Kai and uh, ask questions directly to him. And just one thing we do need to know, of course, Kai, is what is your track record at predicting things in general? I mean, should we should we take you seriously or not as a as a great I, I think psychic? So. I mean, I did a, sim a similar presentation last year and it was um, very um, okay. So most of that happened. And as you see, um, I mean, most of this was really real world examples. So some cutting edge um, tech giants do it already, right? So I'm pretty sure this is coming and let's talk next year again and we will see. <laughs> okay, fantastic. And if we can't find you, then I guess we'll know you're, you're hiding. It's because your predictions weren't so good after all. But uh, I'm yeah. confident we'll see you, Kai. Thank you so much, Kai Werner from Confluent. Mm -hmm.